Okay, uh, Marco, thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, very much appreciated. You obviously are one of the five candidates for the 79th uh, Assembly District looking to replace Shirley Weber, who has been named uh, Secretary of State. So thanks for being here. Of course, thank you guys for having me. Truly an honor. Uh, and just for those watching, a, a brief description of, of Marco, which you can feel free to elaborate on as we get underway with some questions. Um, sure. Businessman born in San Diego, raised in Tijuana, uh, University of San Diego grad, played football, um, lives in Chula Vista currently, married to your high school sweetheart, and you have yeah. two kids. Um, and so let me ask you kind of a general question to start off with. Why do you want to be uh, an assembly person, uh, assembly member in the 79th district? And what do you think is the biggest uh, issue in, in this district that really is pretty diverse and pretty widespread geographically? Sure. Um, you know, having grown up in Mexico and then coming into the country, which I think is the greatest country in the world, um, I was able to experience the American dream. Um, uh, you know, I went through a diff very difficult financial hardship in 2010. And then um, I had a vision of launching a business. And I saw, I saw the greatness of the country. Um, I saw how it's just a country of opportunity and uh, the business grew exponentially. Um, and it was allowed me to fulfill my biggest dream, which was to buy a home for my family. And then fast forward to 2020, I guess I saw a lot of um, injustice is what I felt. And, you know, I've been a part of serving the community as a pastor for so long that I, I could hear the, the cry of, of people's hearts and they didn't feel like things were handled, being handled correctly. And I feel like it could have been done differently. And that's when, when something began to stir on the inside of me and talking to my wife, we just felt like the next part of my, my life was gonna be in public service. And we wanted to fight for the freedoms of the people, our children, um, schools not being open, uh, small businesses. I saw that 19,000, at least 19,000 businesses had permanently closed. And being a, a business owner, I just can't imagine the pain that uh, they were feeling. And then people not being able to work, talking to the community. Um, so we said, you know what, let's, let's give it a run. And we began talking to people uh, in our circle and they fully supported us. Uh, we started raising money and, uh, and, you know, it's easy for someone to say, yeah, you can do it. But then you see their money behind their support. And, um, and we just felt very strong, very, very strengthened. And, and I, I guess I feel like we represent a voice that hasn't been represented in so long in our district. And, and that's why I'm running. How obviously you are replacing um, or would be replacing Shirley Weber. Um, let me ask you a little bit about, about her. What, what part of her record do you respect most? Mm -hmm. And then as a follow-up, how would you continue her work and what would you do differently? Yeah, I would support her uh, work on school choice. Um, th that is actually very personal to me. Um, so I grew up in a not very privileged area in Tijuana. Um, and so my dad actually had a, a small shop. We call them abarrotes. It's you know, it's a very small shop where they sell fruit and, and snacks for the community. And he had this shop at this very, very um, poor area in Tijuana. So I grew up playing sports um, and um, my friends uh, in, on my sports teams, uh, they weren't very fortunate financially. And when I would go help my dad uh, with his shop, I saw extreme poverty. But at the same time, my mom had a dream for me and that was to attend a private school. So she worked so hard so that I could attend this private school. It's called Colegio Patria in Tijuana. So the kids that I surrounded myself at school were kids that were very fortunate financially. 
But then I'd go home and I'd be around the, this other type of kids. And the biggest difference, you know, tracing back uh, for me in my life was education uh, and exposure to a different kind of life and this incredible education. So going on, on going back to Shirley Weber, um, I love that she stood for school choice. And because school choice gives the parents an opportunity, an option that simply doesn't exist without it. So um, I, would, I would continue on that work. And I mean, there's a lot of things that I feel about education, but to answer your question, that's what I admire the most and that's what I support the most. Um, we kind of touched on this right now a little bit, but I'm gonna ask you a little bit more, Marco. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about school reopening? I think you're in South Bay and yeah. um, you have elementary age yeah. children in the uh -huh. school system. So what are your thoughts about when school should open now with this pandemic and everything that's going on? Uh, I, I feel strongly about that. I think we should have opened um, a long time ago. Um, and, and I say that because we had the models, um, places like Florida, for example, um, nearly at 100% instruction, in-person instruction. And in California, we have 5.4. Um, and yet they have fewer cases per capita in Florida. Other schools in our state where private schools that are fully open and, and doing just fine, other public schools that have opened and doing just fine. And, and, and here's, I guess, a bigger question that I have. Um, the kids want to go back to school. The parents want their kids to go back to school. The science is supporting our kids go back to school. The CDC, uh, Rochelle Walensky saying that um, the data is suggesting that the, kid, the schools can safely reopen. Even the teachers could go back without the vaccine, which is another topic. But then you have the science, the teacher, uh, the science, the parents, the kids. Um, so why are our schools still not open? That's the biggest question that I have. Well, let me mm -hmm. let me ask you let me ask you a follow up there. You you know this um, as well as I do that there's multi generational homes in mm -hmm. Latino families, and South Bay has obviously been one of the yeah. hardest hit. And then you have school bus drivers and other staff members and janitors. Um, and when you say the, you know, the parents want the kids to go back, there's still a good number of parents mm -hmm. that don't. So do you think about those other factors when you answer that question? I do. And, and I, I would say, I think it should be up to the parents and up to the teachers, the teachers that want to go back to um, uh, work and the parents that do want to send their kids. Uh, what what the, the school's being closed is affecting the most is the lower socioeconomic tier and the achievement gap because you have you know the private schools open and and our children are the children of those families are advancing and progressing um, but our other kids are not so yeah I, I would support opening up right away Mm -hmm. Have Thank you me. had the opportunity to be vaccinated yet? And if not, do you plan to get the coronavirus vaccine? I have not been vaccinated. Uh, I'm certainly not opposed to it, um, but I haven't been thinking much about it, to be honest with you. With the campaign, I'm <laughs> my brain is constantly thinking of, you know, everything happening, but like I said, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, when the opportunity comes, we'll have to decide. Can you be more specific? Why do you have uh, Why do you have reservations? Are you an anti-vaxxer? I'm, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I know the science. My sister, actually, she's a, she's a scientist um, and she's getting her a PhD on neuroscience at UCSD. And we've had big conversations. I called her and said, hey, teach me, help me understand what's going on. And it's how we've always... Um, dealt with uh, viruses. Um, in fact, with our kids, our kids are vaccinated. Um, it's, it's in conversations with our, our doctors, our pediatricians, I said, hey, this is how we've uh, fought against these diseases. Um, certainly, certainly not opposed to it, like I said, um, but I guess my reservations are that it's, it's, it's so new. So 
this is just me speaking from my heart. You know, I, like I said, I would be very open to it. What more should the state be doing to help public education? The conventional answer is add funding, but there's little evidence that just adding funding makes outcomes of students better. Totally. And, and, and that is the, the, I guess, the easiest way to answer. Um, you know, we need to increase funding and make sure that the funding goes to the students. But from a, a business standpoint, which is what I think I bring to, to the assembly, um, if a client called me and said, hey, Marco, I'm not happy with the service right now. If I answered, hey, I got this, I'm sending more funding to the team, he wouldn't be happy about it. I think from the business standpoint, we have to look at um, the whole system and have a comprehensive analysis. For example, um, if we looked at education as a, as a business organization, we would have to see what are, what's our, our uh, how can we, we rate our production? And that would be test results, graduation rates, parent involvement, um, kids doing extracurricular activities, and, and that's our production side. Then we would have to analyze, well, what is the biggest asset for our production? And the biggest asset we have is teachers. So then I think we would have to analyze, hey, are our teachers happy? Are they getting the proper training? Are they um, getting everything they need to perform? Are they, um, how about our coaches? Do we have enough coaches? Do we have enough teachers? And after that, I think we can truly analyze where should the funding go? Of course, we can say the funding needs to go to the teachers, to the, to the students. But I think what's more important is the funding needs, needs to be um, allocated appropriately to uh, better the outcome of the students. So that would be my, my approach. And I'd love to be a part of the educational committee and try to, I think we need innovative minds in the educational system because it's clear that what we're doing isn't fully working. And let me say this, I love our teacher community, okay? I have friends and I think they, they play such a big role in our community and teaching our kids now more than ever after running this campaign, I have such a um, respect for everyone that, you know, is in the industry of serving people. So, so I would think, would say, let's look at the, at the what is the, the proper, what is the, the right um, approach and how can we improve the final outcome of our children? And then I would look at places like Massachusetts, which is the best, you know, educational system in our country, in our, in, in our nation. Also, let's, let's explore other places in the, in the world because we have to pre prepare our kids to enter the workforce to enter society. Uh, a, quite, a big question I have, are they being tech literate? Let me give you an example. One. My sister that I mentioned, she's getting her PhD at neurosci in neuroscience at UCSD. She's 30. Um, and she was telling me, hey, I had no idea that I needed to know coding for this. So, and she never learned that. So I think we need a, 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 a to look at education from a different angle and make sure our kids are getting the very best. Our letter writers have expressed both support and opposition to the power that the teachers unions wield in the state. And I'm wondering how would you work with the unions and do you think they do a good job for both the students and for the teachers? That's a great question. Um, I've always been a person that I like to listen to people and I like to put myself in other people's shoes. So to answer your question, yes, I would love to work with them. I would love to listen to them. I, I think everyone needs a seat at the table. Now, I think they have a little too much power, to be honest. The fact that our schools are still not open. So I would love to challenge that thought and to call on my fellow Assemblymen and women, if the people of our district would consider me being the best choice to let's relook at that. Let's rethink that. I think 2020 was very revealing. And even what's happening now on all issues, including education and the school unions. Has the pandemic changed your thinking at all about how you would approach housing or transportation? Not necessarily. Um, 
but just common sense to me would say, um, we have a housing issue in California, we need more homes, but I would allocate that to the private sector, uh, to the free market. If we need more homes, well, let's make sure that we encourage our developers to build more homes. And, and I would be, a, I would advocate for eliminating unnecessary regulations so that the cost of the homes are more affordable for our people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that? What, what, which regulations would you um, want to abandon? How would you, how would you specifically, would you spur up housing? I think a, a big one recently was solar, for example. I have solar in my home. My home was built in 2018 and it was an upgrade. It was an option that we had. So I think to say that all homes have to have solar would be an unnecessary regulation. It just jacks up the price, 30, 40 grand. Um, and then other regulations that I would love to be more familiar with. Um, and, and again, my approach would be, let's bring in the developers from the private sector. And then let's bring in the part of our committees that are concerned about you know, wanting to push these regulations and let's come to an agreement because we can still walk together. I think in 2020, we forgot how to dis respectfully disagree, but I think that's something that we need in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marco. Um, shifting gears, let's talk about um, uh, racial mm -hmm. justice and um, kind of in, in the world we live in post George Floyd. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about that rightfully mm -hmm. long overdue. Um, and obviously police unions, police support, as we know is rippling through this race. You've said that, um, um, well, you have, we, you know, maybe we'll get into the specifics of that question a little bit later, but what, how has that event, George Floyd's death and the protests uh, that, that ensued, how has that changed how you um, view equity or, or has it not? Mm. I think we should always have empathy for people that have suffered any kind of injustice. And I think that what we saw was a lot of pain speaking and manifesting in 2020. So I'm very in tuned to that. I'm, I'm a person of color, I can relate. Um, but at the same time, I think we should be very cautious with the rhetoric of equity. Um, let me tell you why. I came into the country as a brown man, and I still am a brown man. <laughs> um, not knowing how to speak English, um, not having a home actually in the US. I cross the border daily. So part of the rhetoric of equity would say that Marco is at a disadvantage and he needs help. But what truly helped me was that my parents always spoke into my brain and my heart. They said, Marco, you can do anything you wanna do in life and you can become anything you wanna become. Nothing can stop you. For any no you get out there, you're gonna get a thousand yeses. So I do understand that people need help but I'm not sure we're going about it the proper way. So I have kids, I have two kids, brown kids. And I think that to embrace the certain part of the equity rhetoric would be to, to embrace a certain kind of, and I wanna say this cautiously, uh, mentality that limits us and would put us under the category of, a, of being a victim of the system. And I think that what our people of color need more than anything, including myself and my children, 
is someone telling them that they can do anything they want to do, they can become anything they want to become, that this country is still the country of opportunity. So that, that's how I feel about the whole thing. I still think that we all have equal opportunities and I don't necessarily support all equal outcomes. My life is a testimony of that. In fact, my biggest client, same thing, came into the country not knowing how to speak English. He's, I'm not sure if he still does. And through hard work, um, he's now one of the biggest distributors of produce in the West Coast. I love what LeBron James is doing. He founded a school for kids. I think that's what we need. Uh, education for our children and speaking into their lives, vision, purpose, mentorship. Um, my dad was not very, um, he tried his best, but he was not always present in my life. Um, but what carried me was coaches, mentors that spoke into my life. The reason why I ended up playing at the University of San Diego was because my high school coach said, hey, Marco, even when I didn't believe in myself, he said, Marco, I think you could play at USD. I said, really? You think I could do that? So then I walked on the team. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, one of my coaches said, Marco, I think you should run for ASB president. I said, you think I could do that? And I ended up running and I won. So I would suggest for programs that speak into our, our, our people of color and really all people, I, if in office, I would love to start a program called Believe in the Dream, where we would partner with community outreach centers like churches, rec centers, schools even, and maybe doing a, a, a two to three week, three hour a day program, only three sessions. And we bring in students of the next, you know, our next generation. We bring in people that are unemployed or people that simply want purpose in their lives. And we help them discover what their gifts are, their talents are, uh, we do, there's a, a great program called Strengths, program, uh, Strengths Finders, and it helps you understand how you're wired. So once they understand this, um, we can speak into their lives, give them options. Hey, this is what you could do. Nothing can stop you. Sky's the limit. Uh, do workshops like buying a home, for example, bring in realtors to teach people of the lower socioeconomic tier that don't know. Listen, for me, buying a home was seemed like an insurmountable task, but then I was educated. So teaching people, hey, this is what you would need to buy a home someday. Bring in entrepreneurs and saying, hey, this is how you could start a business someday. Um, I, I firmly believe that if we did something like that, which is life skills, uh, we would see more nurses in the workforce. We would see more entrepreneurs, would see more teachers um, because we would help people find their purpose. So I know it's a long answer, but I just feel strongly about the issue. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the, the nuance of it. Uh, one thing you didn't touch on um, was uh, what much of this is seen through, which is the law enforcement lens. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a systemic racism in law, law enforcement? I think we have to look at the bigger picture. Let me tell you why. I didn't know this, but 40% of all police stops are interactions with homeless people. And there was an article uh, that came out in the Voice of San Diego in 2020 that said that while black people represent 5% of the population, they represent 22% of the homeless population. That means that if a police officer approached a group of 20 homeless people, there should be one black person but the statistics show there are five of them. So that explains the disparities in my opinion. Now I had a conversation with um, a group of them and they were, again, I said, I wanna hear you guys, tell me how you feel. And, and they were giving me all kinds of statistics. Like they have 600 to a million stops a year of which only two to 3% are forceful interactions. And one of the candidates on the first debate said there shouldn't be any forceful interactions. Well, that sounds like a very ideal world, but you have people out there that are committing crime and doing bad things. So of course there's gonna be forceful interactions, but 
I do know that big cities, other big cities would die to have the numbers that we have. Uh, they said only eight to 10 shootings a year. So I think that explains the disparities. And I just don't think we give enough credit to our, our police officers. I think it's time that we begin to honor them. And I think it's on our, in our best interest. Uh, let me add to that uh, on you know police reform and defunding the police. What took place in Minneapolis last year just helped us all understand what would happen in our cities if we went on towards that approach. They, first, they cut 1 million in funding and they demonized the officers. A bunch of them left, quit. So the people had to wait longer for police response because they were spread too thin. And violent crimes increased by 21%, according to the Daily Mail. Property crime increased by 10%. And they had an increase of nearly 1,000 incidents in crime. So I don't think that's the way to go. My approach would be the exact opposite, which I saw um, that um, the city council increased about 27 million in funding. And it's, I, I think it's exactly what we need. And let me say this too, when it comes to police reform, I would advocate for everyone to have a seat at the table. We have to get rid of bad police officers. Absolutely, we still have to have accountability. I would suggest, having representatives from the police department, having someone like Chief Zimmerman, a hero in San Diego, uh, and then having um, social justice um, advocates and reformers. And let's have a conversation. How can we do a better job in San Diego, which I already think we're doing a great job, but how can we improve upon it? Let me just bring the but question back to, say, uh, to, to, to Shirley Weber. Uh, as we're talking about equity and, and, and just really short uh, answers. Mm -hmm. I want to get your your perspective on whether you supported or did not some of our major pieces of legislation on, along these lines. Um, mm -hmm. Your use of force bill, did you support that or oppose it? And Can why? you elaborate on it? Yeah, change the de definition to make it more restrictive. To be honest with you, I would need a bit more it information the, on the bill. It changed the definition of when a police officer could use lethal force from when he thought it was reasonable to when he thought it was necessary to protect the imminent, prevent the imminent loss of life. So it adopted the strictest standard in America. I would... If it was better for our people, I would definitely support it. Now, I understand you haven't given a lot of thought to that, though. Is this is this the first time you've been given get thinking about this issue? This was one of arguably her <clears throat> biggest signature bill in the last couple of years. I had thought about it, but I'm just not sure how the police officers feel about it. Um, I thought about the bill on decertifying the police. And I think it's, it's a great first start, first step. Um, but as long as the committee that would be, um, you know, judging the scenarios was not biased. You know, if we had an unbiased group deciding on these factors, that's what I would support. And I think it's, it'd be easy for me to say Yes, I support the bill, or no, I support the bill. Um, but I just feel like I need a bit more time to study. And this is what you get with me. I'm not going to pretend I know it all, OK? Um, the filter by which I would make decisions is let's bring everyone to the table. And you would get in me someone who's dedicated 10 years of his life, the last 10 years, to problem solving. And I would love to do what I've always done, identify, analyze, and execute. And last question for me, I've been bogarting the mic, I'm gonna pass it in a second, but I'm curious where, what you think about her, um, her legislation on reparations, uh, the state's study of, of, of that issue. There's a task force um, looking at, do you, do you support the issue of reparations? Where do you stand on, on that for the African-American community? I don't think, 
it's fair for the people of today to have to pay for injustices that happened 150 years ago. Um, I think what's better for all of us is to move on, to try to unite. And if there was anything about reparations, I would suggest investing in the next generation and investing in um, education for people that are less fortunate. I get to your point about how uh, Minneapolis and how badly things went for public safety last year happened, but I'm also not clear uh, why you presume that you can assume that police will have good faith on reform issues. It wasn't until last June that they stopped using the chokehold in San Diego. And last year, the city council felt compelled to pass a law that says if one police officer sees another police officer do something bad, he should intervene. So there's this culture of impunity where police believe they can get away with things. And so police get away with things. So it's possible to both believe that officers are generally heroes, but also believe that officers cover up for each other. So I'd like to hear your perspective on uh, why you would give the benefit of the doubt to, to officers acting and doing in the right thing, the right way, when there's so many issues where you can point to them and say, they didn't do the right thing. They've got their police union power and they felt like they could act with impunity. No, I do support accountability, 100%. And I love what Chief uh, Zimmerman said, that no one wants, no good, no one wants a, a bad cop to be, you know, um, um, you know, decertified more than a good cop, something like that. Um, so I think we should have accountability. I do support that. And I think that our police officers want accountability. Um, so if, that would improve our police departments. I'm, I'm with you on that. Switching gears to climate change. Uh, what more do you think could be done to limit the financial environmental damage of climate change in our region? And of course, we're particularly interested in wildfire threats. Yeah, I think we need to do anything that can be done to stop uh, the damage of wildfires, allocate the proper funding so that we don't lose more homes and people lose their livelihoods. In regards to climate change, I think we, my stance is to continue to learn about the subject um, and technology. How can we continue to improve upon it? I care about climate and I care about our children having um, a great world, you know, when they grow up. Do you, do you get a sense that the, uh, the, the climate um, change plans that the state and the city and the county have all put together, do they actually serve a, a purpose or are they, are they just something, uh, a goal worth heading towards, but never really realistically attained? I think it's, heading in the right direction. Um, so I would support to continue to learn about the subject, but I would love to analyze uh, the bills being introduced to make sure they are realistic, Thank you. for sure. Marco, I'm, I'm hoping to go back to the South mm -hmm. Bay again. Your district would include Bonita, Chula Vista, National mm -hmm. City, and Bonita and National City are very different as have been um, the way certain populations have been treated during this COVID uh, pandemic that we're living in. Um, what would you do differently? You know, what do you see that have been some of the issues and problems and what would you do differently? In regards to- The pandemic in the South Bay being hit so hard. I think the biggest impact was the extreme lockdowns in our state. Again, you look at places like Florida where they've been open, fully open since September. And I know the governor um, always brought up social distancing and he brought up following the guidelines and he gave power to the individual of, and even small business owners. 
to whether or not open up and make sure that things are done safely, properly and in order. So that's what I think has been the biggest factor, the extreme lockdowns in our state. Um, like I've said it before, I would support opening up our small businesses safely. I think the data uh, shows that it's, we get the same numbers um, and the best stimulus in our economy right now would be getting people back to work. And that's how I feel a lot of the people that I'm representing um, are feeling. What about the disparities though in the way things have been handled with communities of color and also just the vaccine rollout Okay. Particularly in the South Bay, particularly in the South Bay. Well, I know we have an issue um, and vaccine wise, like I said, I wouldn't be opposed to it myself. Um, and I know that's how we fight viruses. So if I was in the assembly uh, representing my district, I would fight to make sure that we have the proper uh, vaccines for all of our people. Um, I know there was a statement that people of color didn't know how to use the internet. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, but I think we could have done a better outreach to our communities um, and reaching out to them and letting them know, hey, the vaccine is available. Um, and this is how you can apply for it. So in the, if in the assembly, I would have worked with our local programs and making sure that we reach out to the community to make sure this is done. I know in my, my parents do not live here, by the way. I'm not sure if your parents are here in Chula Vista, mm -hmm. Tijuana, mm -hmm. or if they're with you or not. Um, both of, one of my parents needed assistance to try to get information about the vaccine. The other, actually both of, one of them needed assistance, the other one didn't. She, she was able to get it. Was that the case for your parents? Did they, did they need help? Did you have to help them? They, in terms of the vaccine? Yes. No, they live here in, uh, in Altai Ranch in our district um, and they haven't gotten the vaccine. Uh, and I think they're just waiting to see how things play out. Um, but I know they are interested in getting it. But I'm saying, could they do that on their own or are they gonna need assistance? Because that's kind of the crowd that we're talking about here. A yeah. lot of elderly Latino people who have mm -hmm. could not maneuver the system the way it's been set up. Yeah, they would probably uh, reach out to my sister or I to help them. And they haven't done that yet? No, they haven't. Like I said, they're waiting to see how things play out with the vaccine and everything. It, it kind of sounds to me so far from what you said that you're not sure you're going to get the vaccine or your parents are not sure that you're going to get the vaccine. Is that is that where you're at? Because that, that is very important messaging as you're taking if you were to take on this role. Yes. No, I'm like I said, I'm not opposed to getting the vaccine. Let me give you a little more background. I gone to the doctor myself maybe once or twice in the last 10 years. I've always been a person of health. So um, medical visits for me have not been often. Um, and I do trust the vaccine, but right now I'm waiting to for the proper moment and my parents to be honest we haven't talked about the vaccine so i'm not sure exactly how they feel about it but if they said hey i want to get the vaccine i would support them and i'll say hey, yeah, across america vaccine. across america elected leaders have made an open show of getting their vaccines photographed because they're trying to send out a message you if you mm -hmm. get elected you're a leader who's supposed to send a message how is being ambivalent about the vaccine sending a positive message with so many americans dead that's a great point. And if that was the case, and I was sending a message to the community, I would get the vaccine in public too. 
How, how would you rate? I want to take, take you, can I just real quickly take you back to something you said that, that, that jumped out at me? You said there's a statement that people of color don't know how to use the internet, but I don't necessarily agree with that. What, what do you mean? What, what's the necessarily that that's flatly a racist statement, if anyone has said that? That people of color can't use the internet. Yes, I said, I, I know it was said uh, by President Biden. And I said, I don't agree with that. I think people of color know how to use the internet. Okay. How would you rate the performance of Govan or, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom? I'm in support of the recall. I think his approach um, to the well-being of our state has failed us. I think we need new leadership. I think the extreme lockdowns caused a lot of harm to our people, economic harm. Um, our children, for example, suffering from anxiety, depression, uh, suicide rates. I know in LA, uh, in one month, the suicide rate went up by 8,000%. I know the CDC did a survey of where 40% of the respondents stated they had begun either a behavioral or um, an emotional uh, condition. Um, I also saw that there was another survey where 13.3% of the people responded that they had either begun or increased substance use. And I just think that it didn't have to be that way. I think the approach was very extreme and and that's why one of the reasons why I think we need balance in Sacramento. I think we need another conservative up there that can, I think it's in the best interest of our state to have a conservative Latino in the assembly. Who do you view as being uh, the, you know, the Republican leaders of uh, the party locally and nationally? Locally, I like Kevin Kiley. I like um, Gallagher. Mm, I think they're really fighting to open up our schools, letting our kids play again. Um, I like Paula Witzel. I think is doing a great job here in San Diego. Uh, I felt so much support from her and the team. Mm, I love the Central Committee. And uh, nationally, I think it's still to be discovered who's going to take, you know, the lead nationally. So Dr. Wepper was really, you know, she leaves a legacy of introducing a lot of legislation and actually getting it signed by the governor, you know, pretty success story in that sense. But do you have specific legislation that you want to take straight, straight there and put in, put into motion um, any, you know, specific, uh, issues that, you know, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of the coronavirus and, you know, there are other issues to uh, think about, obviously not too near the end of the coronavirus, but are you forward thinking towards other, or maybe coronavirus specific legislation? Obviously you've talked a lot about opening schools and that sort of thing, but what issues will you walk in there if you're elected and really try and tackle? Totally, I would focus on um, education first. Um, I think our children, in high school would be really um, strengthened by uh, curriculums that would teach him life skills. Um, so it's something I've been thinking about. So I would explore the idea of introducing uh, a bill like that. Um, life skills that prepare our children to enter the workforce, um, learning how to budget, um, learning how to pay your taxes, um, helping them with vision, like some of the things I was talking about. And economically, I'd love to be a part of the economic committee and working with across the aisle, Democrats, Republicans. Uh, I love how, you know, if you go to a party, you don't ask someone, hey, are you a Democrat or Republican? You just have a conversation. And I've always been a person that I can work with anybody. And I'd love to work with, um, fellow assemblymen and women, and, and whether they're Democrats or Republicans, 
and making sure we boost the economy in California. For example, I think the fact that there are big companies that are leaving our state and families leaving our state um, is not a good sign for our state. So I'd love to introduce bills that would help our small business community um, to make it easy for them to launch businesses, which I believe is the engine of our economy. It creates jobs, gives people an opportunity to provide for their families. So that's what I would focus on. Is there anything specific when it comes to the economy? Like, do you have any, you know, plans in place or plans that you'd walk in with? I, I would love to help, um, like I said, with uh, the housing industry and helping create opportunities for, I know in Riverside, um, they just passed, I think, um, a bill where they were, they were mandating for developers to um, build 30,000 homes, but no developer wanted to jump in because it wasn't profitable. It wasn't cost effective. So that's where I think we need innovative minds, uh, people that maybe have a better understanding in regards to business and how we can, let's bring the private sector, let's bring the, you know, the assembly, how can we make this work for all of California? Take you back to that. I know we talked about housing earlier, but when you talk innovations, there have been a lot of innovations thrown out in recent years that have not succeeded in Sacramento where the focus has, you know, largely been on subsidized housing. What, what specific innovations would you bring? And, and, and specifically, what do you think about uh, zoning issues and, 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 and changing maybe single family home uh, areas to have more housing? Well, I don't think subsidizing homes would be the best approach. I think the private sector is the best way to go about it. In terms of innovations, I mean, just the mindset. And, and I would love to learn more about the subject within the assembly and how we can make it easier for our developers to build more homes, which is a problem we, we clearly have in California. Okay. It's, to me, it's, you know, very simple. You know, I studied economics in, at USD and, you know, one of the basics of economics is the law of demand and supply. The prices are so high because we don't have enough supply of homes. So we need to, we need to fix that. And on the notion of single family homes and putting more density in, in neighborhoods that uh, may need it, but may not want it. How would you handle that issue? Mm -hmm. I think you need both. I think you need um, single family homes and, and multi um, family complexes. So even if, we, we have to look, think from the macro standpoint and what's better for all of us. So I would support building both. Marco, I'd like to go back. Um, you, you were the one that mentioned you being a pastor and I wanted to know more about that. If you could tell us a little bit about that and would you continue that type of work if you were move, you know, if you move on um, as an assembly member. And also what has your congregation done during the pandemic to help the community it serves? Yes. Um, so I will always be involved in whatever church I attend. If I was in Sacramento, I'd have to find a church in Sacramento. I don't think I'd have the time to be in a pastoral role, if you will. Um, now, my church uh, decided to stay open. I go to a church called Awaken Church. And the, the reason why was because there was a lot of incidents where people were suffering from a mental health and um, thoughts of suicide. And our leaders felt like the best approach would be to um, open up and have people come and help the community with that crisis. And I think we've done a, just a great job in serving the community in that way. And I'm sorry, can you tell us where the church is located? Um, yeah, the campus I go to is in Eastlake. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Awaken Church was in the news for disobeying county public health orders, right? Is that is that the case? And and did you support yes. that effort? Um, I yes, I think um, my pastors are the most courageous people I've ever met, and they saw the pain of the people um, with the mental health issues, um, the anxiety and depression going through the roof, uh, thoughts of suicide. And um, while they analyze too, would it be safe for people to come? And they always encouraged people to follow the guidelines and social distancing. And we had um, um, ventilators in the campuses um, and I was very proud of the fact that they chose to serve the community in that way. How uh, Shane Harris, who's a local activist, uh, uh, famously called on the Awakened Church to cease and desist that and, and called it immoral. How, how it's an interesting situation as a leader to Chris's question earlier about vaccinations and the importance of. Uh, uh, urging everyone to get vaccinated to maybe getting vaccinated yourself on social media or on camera. How would you square that? Hey, Chris, thank you for that advice, by the way. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I see that. But this is a difficult situation where there are mental health issues. Clearly, it's a driving debate in the schools uh, issue. But here, um, that has been a point of friction for many in California, a lot of litigation and as the aforementioned Shane Harris said, it was, it's an, in his view, an immoral act uh, by the church. Yeah, I would disagree 100%. And, and one of the, you know, questions was how can a strip club be open, but not the church? And the church is there to help the community. We have a great program, a recovery program that helps people out of addictions and process through all of the intense uh, emotions that are so prevalent today. So I would say that I believe the opposite. I'm very proud that we open up to help all the people. We, if not, who was going to do it? And we had to do it. And like I said, we had other places in, this, in the nation, like Florida, for example, they were fully open and they were doing just fine. In fact, uh, fewer cases per capita. So I, I stand by that. And I think we, we helped a lot of people. Thanks for explaining. Were, were there masks? Were people wearing masks? Because you mentioned social distancing, but I mm -hmm. didn't hear you mention anything about masks. And do, do, do you wear a mask? Does your family wear masks? Some people wore masks and some didn't. And are I, you okay I, with that? Um, yes, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think the mask helps um, prevent from the vi virus from spreading, but I think it's up to the person to choose if they want to wear a mask or not. Do you wear one? I wear When I have to, yes. What does that mean? When do you define have to? Um, like at the bank or, you know, walking into a restaurant. Um, but I certainly don't wear one, you know, at home. Or, you know, once I sit down, I prefer not to. Um, uh, I wanted any other to, questions for Marco? I, I have one. Yeah, there was a question that came up in the debate last week that was kind of raised in the chat. And I don't think the um, moderator for Voice of San Diego got to it, but some of the participants or the listeners asked whether you can say confidently that President Biden was legitimately elected. Um, do you believe that? And the second part of the question is, what do you think is the future of the Republican Party and bipartisan government in this era following the Trump presidency? Yeah, I think it was a tough race. Um, I think what made it really hard for people to digest was the change in the electoral process in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, I think it was close, but I do think Biden won. And um, in terms of the party moving forward, 
I think we all experienced um, a lot of pain January 6th. Um, and I think it caused us to dig deep into who we are. And I think I had a lot of thoughts and I realized, you know what, as a conservative and a part of the Republican party, we're the party of family, party of um, opportunity, the party of the American dream. We're a party of the free market economy, uh, capitalism, um, the party of values and hard work. And I was just very encouraged um, after that. And I think moving forward, there's a better way forward. I think it's time to move on and, um, and seek to unite. And I think we have the message. I think that's the American dream. I think we all want to go after our own American dream. And I think that's what's going to bring us together and help us move forward. What were you saying you were encouraged by specifically related to uh, January 6th? Uh, not January 6th, my own thoughts of how it caused me. I said, we all experienced a lot of pain January 6th. I don't think I talked all day, um, but then it caused me to dig deep into who I was. And I'm a person of family values. I wanna serve the community. I'm on what's best for the community. And I'm a person that I've always chosen to listen before I spoke. My mom always taught me, hey, think before you talk. Um, and I think that's who we are as a party. In fact, going through this whole candidacy, um, meeting the different caucuses and Paula and, and the whole team, the Republican party in San Diego made me really proud of being a Republican. It's like a family. It's truly, you just feel like so much love and that's who we are. So I'm, I'm, I was very encouraged by that. Thanks Marco. Um, last question to you then, um, you know, give us your closing elevator pitch. You kind of said that at the outset too, but you, you know, you got 30 seconds to reach voters. What, were you, what do you tell them? Yeah, as you send me to Sacramento, um, you're going to send a problem solver, someone who can identify problems, someone who can analyze and execute. You send someone who served a community for 20 years, who wants to put the people first, and who will always advocate for policies that bring freedom and power to the individual and policies that will help you, the voter, fulfill your own American dream. Thank you, that might've been 30 seconds exactly. I wasn't, I wasn't keeping track, but I was pretty close. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. It's nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Thank you.